And he sat down with Emmanuel Dan. With resources, it's a very pure and binary outcome. Normally, either a production is good enough to get to commercial viability, or it isn't. That's what I really like, because it's almost like a treasure hunt in many ways. This asset, I believe, will make up 1% to 2% of the GDP of the country. How do you think about that risk? So I think that the risk of the economics being affected by royalty raises, I don't think it's going to happen. The market always struggles with valuing resource companies fairly, but then once they're de risk that's when you really get your big upside. You know, a good management team can't make a bad project good. Money miners, welcome to the 16th of August, Wednesday. Um, JD, he's gone rogue in Melbourne. <laughs> he's, uh, we've let him out. He's like a... What's a, off that movie? He's like he's like a peacock. You just got to let him fly. <laughs> he's he's out there spreading his wings, going man solo in Melbourne. Absolutely shitting bricks trying to set up cameras and audio <laughs> recording equipment. It's going rogue. I think it's good for his uh, professional development, don't you, Trav? Ah, uh, I oh, mate, I, I'm uh, I reckon he's killing it out there. He doesn't he doesn't need any of our uh, our advice on how to bloody set up equipment. He's he's enjoying his <laughs> Melbourne chai lattes and um, flash skateboards over there. Exactly. So, hipster, exactly. He's going back into hipster mode. Yeah. Right. And he sat down with Emmanuel Dat. Oh, the Dats and 180B. Absolute legendary friend of the show. Yep. Uh, Real friend, not a, not a, a not, not friend. like a, yeah, he's a GC <laughs> friend. Um, yeah, buddy, Daddy's, uh, Daddy's pretty bloody popular on the podcast things yep. today, but I'd say he obviously he's, uh, gets the most benefit out of coming on to ours. I would have thought so. Like, no, no shit. Yeah. So um, any, any, I guess, preview of what they had a yarn about? Well, I, th- I thought when we had Emmanuel on, like the audience got a, a, a bit of a sniff of his um, sheer intellectual horsepower. and uh, But that was all sort of confined to the one stock, WA1, and, and it was, you know, that one sector, Rare Earths. And I think what's um, pretty awesome about, you know, JD going and sitting down with, uh, you know, Emmanuel while he's in Melbourne is the fact that we get to see how Emmanuel thinks of the broader world and, and a lot more broader themes in this space. So I'm pretty excited to to have a deep listen and um and, and go on a bit of a journey as JD unpacks his brain, mate, because I think it's a big brain. Mm, oh, exactly. And, and the one thing that stands out to me, in addition to his intellectual capacity and fundy noust, is uh, old Manny D is just a really nice, genuine person, absolute, absolute gentleman. So and that goes a long way. Uh, yep. in the industry, I think. So yep. much kudos to him as just as a bloody good bloke. So, right, let's rip it. Uh, first up, oh, can't forget the bloody sponsors. No. God, how good are partners? Oh, K-Drill. K-Drill. So pretty much the face of K-Drill, you'd say, is Ryan O'Sullivan. You got to meet <laughs> Ryan out diggers. I, I was blessed I've meeting Ryan. I've talked to that man up. For he, years. Oh, he is a legend. I he like is him a lot. bloody legend. I don't, know, I don't know how you meet all these nice people, Matty. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you know? I think a lot. They just gravitate towards me. <laughs> Maybe I'm a nice person as well. But, um, like, for a man that hasn't been on a drill for a while, like, you see, he's got that good frame about him. Like, solid bloke. Like, it some does. good genetics. Yeah. And uh, he's using those genetics to drive K drill <laughs> into, yeah. the, into the drive, not drive them into the ground, drive the bloody drill bit into the ground to find some bloody yeah. ore for the industry. Surface drills. Surface, surface drills. Yeah. drills. But he, he did his time underground drilling. Oh, he's, no, he's done a bit of both. Yeah. He's done everything. Yeah, but he's like K-Drill doing, doing the surface rigs these days. Mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's um, – so shout out to them as a bloody great podcast partner. Thank you, K-Drill. K-Drill. Uh, and we also got our great – can't forget Terra Capital. Pretty much anyone that comes on as a, as a partner – has to sort of pass my bromance filter, <laughs> have to develop some sort of bromance, which uh, Maddie Langsford and Jeremy Bond have. Shout out to the lads. I hope they and like D- it. And, and Dylan Kelly as well. So yeah. Terra Capital uh, will be coming on for a show sometime again soon. So I'm keen to really dive into the TSX with them. Half their half their fund is in the TSX. I'm a bit worried if 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 that one's in person because I'm I'm not sure you'll be able to control yourself I'll sitting on not, your side of the room. I'll try not to kiss them <laughs> on camera. Right, let's get let's get this podcast. We have had uh, comments on YouTube about it's too ocker and uh, we're uh, not good for a finance channel. But um, uh, uh, as I said on the YouTube comment, it's not tax. This is not a mandatory thing. Please go elsewhere <laughs> if you don't like it. <laughs> But you can stay if you want. Right, eh? let's rip it. JD and Emmanuel Dat from Dat Capital having a bloody good yarn. Here we go. G'day, money miners. We've got a special guest 
in store today, Emmanuel Dat from Dat Capital. How are you? Great. Thanks, Janus. Thanks for having us. No problem at all. Why don't we just get started by you giving a bit of an overview of yourself and um, then a bit about Dat Capital to start with. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been investing in resources um, right from the word go. Um, I started investing myself sort of back in, uh, it was about 2006 and I um, uh, started off in resources during um, the good old uranium boom. And um, it was a really exciting time because I was sort of um, at the tail end of my university degree in my studies. And um, it's effectively the um, resource sector that got me hooked to investing overall. So um, something that we uh, that I'm very grateful for, <laughs> for discovering early on. And um, it's definitely sort of, um, uh, you know, dictated the um, direction of my life going forward from that stage. Beautiful. And there's one question we need to get out of the way to start with. Mm. I saw a few years ago now you wrote about tin. I had, Trav would kill me if I didn't ask you, are you still a tin baron? Yes and no. I think that, um, you know, any sort of commodity um, tends to go through a cycle. And um, I think that the fundamentals are definitely improving for tin. So uh, I am at the moment. <laughs> Beautiful. There's something I noticed on your website, um, a little quote I want to read out. Dat Capital is focused on generating alpha by structuring its portfolio in a unique and uncorrelated manner. Now, I want to start by digging into that unique manager, uh, unique aspect. What do you guys do as a fund manager that is unique to compared to other fund managers? Yeah, sure. So what we do um, that's unique is that we are sector agnostic. So we're not just in resources or industrials, for example. Um, so that is something that um, is slightly unique, but also we invest in a, a concentrated manner as well. So we typically hold uh, between 10 and 20 positions at any one stage, but also um, we can go across asset classes, meaning that we um, at this point in this um, in our flagship fund, which is absolute return strategy, which has been running for five years now, um, we've returned uh, fifteen uh, oh over fifteen and a half percent per annum net to our investors, and um, a lot of that oh yeah, I think a lot of um, that performance has ultimately come from the flexibility in being able to invest in fixed income at times and um, also blending that with uh, equities, of course. And that uncorrelated aspect lends itself to managing across asset classes and, you know, not being correlated against many different things, I guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, during big um, mar you know, equity market downturns, it's always beneficial to have um, the downside protection of fixed uh, interest investments. And um, yeah, I think that ultimately all great investors um, are flexible in their approach. And how currently do you balance the fixed income versus equity balance in the portfolio? Well, um, a lot of it comes down to um, attractive opportunities. For example, you know, over the past three years, we saw interest rates um, go through the floor. So of course, um, it, it wasn't, um, we weren't finding very many attractive opportunities that sort of met our um, hurdle rates and criteria. Um, so, you know, we've we've become progressively much more equity focused and, you know, the, the fixed income element at this stage is um, quite a uh, uh, minor and insignificant portion of portfolio. But, um, you know, going back to that cyclical approach, Mark, you know, there's a time and place, um, yeah, for every, any investment uh, depending on the market cycle. And on the fixed income aspect, has that sort of rebounded as rates have come back up, you know, to five plus percent in the US, four and a bit here in Australia? We're definitely finding um, more opportunities, I would say, um, that, that look to be attractive. Uh, once you dig down, um, it's not always the case that they're investable. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm definitely sort of seeing green shoots uh, um, on the fixed income side. So you guys also talk about maintaining discipline and, you know, betting where you have the odds heavily uh, skewed in your favour. This is something that sounds attractive and probably easier said than done. How do you maintain discipline to start with when, you know, like you just touched on in 2021, everything's going crazy, you got rates at zero thereabouts. How do you maintain discipline through those cycles? Sure. Well, I think a lot of it comes down to uh, portfolio construction. You always have to be very um, aware of um, the, the risk you know, at the position level and at the portfolio level. And uh, what I mean by that is that you need to be aware of the correlation between you know, certain positions. 
um, that uh, may be in the portfolio. So for example, um, last year, we were invested in a number of coal names. And of course, these are all you know, very heavily correlated, whereas um, tin and coal, probably not so much. <laughs> so just being aware of um, uh, you know, the correlation, but also the position sizing is something that um, a lot of people don't really or necessarily consider enough, I would say. Um, you have to, it's, it's a very fine line. You don't want to be too underweight because ultimately you're doing the work, you want to benefit from any potential upside, but you've also got to take a very practical approach and think that, well, if a position gets cut in half tomorrow because of an externality that's unforeseen, you don't want, I mean, you can't stop the hurt, but you don't want it to hurt too much that way you can't recover. Absolutely. And how do you go about finding those opportunities where the the odds are heavily skewed? I think that ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, you have to take a position on where you think the world will be tomorrow, ultimately. And um, you have to structure your portfolio in such a way that um, you're trying to capture what you think will happen in the future. Um, I think that also there are very practical realities, um, you know, just referring back to the resources space, um, you know, things like the Lausanne curve, uh, uh, you know, a, fav- quite, a favorite at my quite mind. typical sort of uh, market models, I would say. Yeah. And um, being familiar with these sort of um, models really can drive alpha ultimately, because you, if you know how the market uh, will perceive, um, you know, and or you know, value an opportunity during certain points of its development life cycle, um, you can really generate a lot of alpha by understanding. Well, you know, um, the valuation might tick up once they start production, for argument's sake, uh, which is almost always the case, assuming they have no uh, ramp up issues. So, you know, very simple, um, pragmatic uh, things like that can really um, augment your returns over time. Beautiful. And on idea generation as well, something I've heard you flag in the past is using social networks. Now, I assume one of them you might be touching on is Twitter there. And Twitter's one I, I struggle with. I find there's a lot of noise, a lot of a echo chamber type dynamic. How do you sort of separate, you know, how do you extract value from Twitter and not get, you know, drowned out with all the noise? Um, I think that you have to be very good at filtering information. Um, I think that um, Twitter is a great equalizer because there are so many people behind anonymous profiles for it instance that um, are actually very credible and well credentialed ultimately i find it a really great forum to share information and receive information um, as well so um but yeah you know there are a lot of um people that um you know they're, they're very good thinkers ultimately and um even though they may not be professional investors i think that um you can amalgamate enough nuggets of information that once you aggregate it all Um, you know, not, of course, relying primarily on that, but um, it definitely can help inform, um, you know, your evaluation of the situation and ultimately a decision. Agreed. I'd be lying if I said the guys at Money of Mine haven't picked up some ideas. There's definitely some good analysis out there. Just the the separating is the key bit. On this sort of thread, from my understanding, you have six team members at DAT Capital? Uh, Uh, I think we're at at about eight now. At about eight. Okay. How do you weigh getting advice from others versus getting up the co- uh, getting up the the curve, so to speak, yourself on some sort of analysis? Yeah. Say a new commodity or something um, like that. Yeah, we rely solely on internal research, and why that is is because um, we like to really go deep into the details. Um, we like to really understand um, all the drivers of any particular position um, without you know, um, the marketing um, sheen, I guess, applied to it. So we want to know everything warts and all in a and, nutshell. And how long does the the process generally take for you guys to get to an investment decision? Uh, fairly quickly, I would say. Um, you know, over our um, lifetime, um, as I mentioned, it's been about oh, over five years since we've been operational. So we've actually got a very um, detailed and uh, deep uh, yeah, um, research library, I like to call it, of um, you know, over 1,600-odd um, opportunities that we've looked at over that time. So um, it really does um, speed up our 
our process in terms of evaluating you know how good a project is or how how um, good it could be and um, yeah just being across all these details and having studied um, uh, you know a, a certain sector or you know a deposit intensively in the past um, it definitely does sort of shorten the time to evaluate and does that lend itself to short-term trading dynamic or do you prefer to stick to a, a buy and hold type of investment process uh yeah we're not short-term traders by any means we really like to identify those projects that are special and um, so we really do have a quality bias um, I think that um, it's very seductive to think that um, oh, I can trade in and out of the stock short, yeah, in the short term and that might generate me a bit extra, you know, a few extra bips of performance. Um, I, that's not us. In a nutshell, we're after really uh, investments that perform well and can do multiples over a multi-year time frame. That's what we're about. And how much does instinct or intuition play into your investment process? I think that instinct is informed by um, the information that you already know in many ways. Sure. Um, I can, yeah, if you gave me something fresh, um, like let's just say it's a resource deposit, I can probably look at the tonnage and at the grade and, you know, effectively. Is that instinctive? I can instinctively look at it and say, well, that's not going to work or yeah, that's pretty good. So I think that, you know, in many ways, you know, I, I think instinct is different from gut, you know, use, you know a gut feel yeah. or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that um, typically when I look at something new, I sort of have an instinct, well, this could work or, you know, it's not going to work at all. <laughs> it's kind of a little bit binary, but it doesn't mean that we don't sort of dig deeper. Yeah. So there's another thing that really stood out to me. Uh, I believe I read this on your website. Mm. It says that DAT doesn't engage management teams prior to making an investment. And this on the surface sounds great over the past few months, us at Money of Mine interviewing a bunch of people. We understand it's it's very hard to come to an unbiased judgment once you meet people. I think the the inclination for, for many people is to, to like other people. So how do, you, how do you balance and how do you get across a management team beyond just looking at the incentive structure that the management team has in place? How do you get comfortable with them before making that investment? Uh, I think there are a few different ways um, uh, to do that. I think that, of course, you look at the incentive structure, but I think that's only a very small portion. Um, you obviously look at their background um, their skill sets, um, all these sort of aspects. But I think ultimately it comes down to the fact that, um, you know, a good management team can't make a bad project good, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? And so that's why I say that um, it's probably um, a part of our process where um, you can always tell what good, man oh, good management teams because the numbers will stack up, for instance, right? And um, ultimately, you know, it goes back to that fact that you mentioned, right, that we as individuals, we have a natural instinct to um, like, want to like the other person, right? And um, you tell me one CEO or you find me one CEO that doesn't believe in their company and what they're doing. Sure. Will you then get, uh, you know, acquainted whatnot with the, with the management once you've made an investment and become sort of closer as close as a, a manager and a company's management can be? Or will you just keep, keep your distance? Uh, well, it really depends on the opportunity, I think. Um, you know, there have been many cases where we haven't bothered because we think, oh, well, we're across the situation. There's only so many um, aspects of the business and of the industry that management can control. You know, so um, in, in many cases, we haven't bothered. But I'll probably say that's not typical. You know, if we obviously um, uh, want to be in a stock for a long time, over many years, um, in a in a big way, then generally we do like to engage with management teams after you know sort of the investment decision. Yeah, it is actually an aspect where I think that does differ somewhat. There's many other managers that we speak with that are quite dependent, for want of a better word, mm. in following highly regarded management teams. You know, the likes of Mark Clark at Capricorn sticks out, and the the backers will. 
follow mm. them stock to stock. How does, um, or why rather did you guys start the firm as an absolute return firm mm. rather than say relative return? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I guess it all stems back to the fact that I was managing my family's capital uh, sort of prior to setting up uh, the fund itself. And so um, I did very well. And um, it was really, uh, the, oh, the absolute return fund was really an extension of what we were already doing and that we we're very comfortable with. Um, ultimately, um, I'm very focused and conscious of um, having downside protection whilst not um, capping my upside. <laughs> but you you also don't um, utilize short selling in your yeah. in your sort of framework. Why is that? What are the sort of pitfalls of short selling in your opinion? Uh, I think short selling uh, is overrated. I think that um, there have been many academic studies to sort of demonstrate that well, in many cases, um, short selling doesn't add value. You know because um, you have many different risks. You have counterparty risk, for example. Um, you yes, have yeah. um, cost risk because you know, the cost of short selling changes day on day. And um, yeah, ultimately it wasn't aligned with, our, with uh, my personality. Yeah. I'm generally an optimistic person. Uh, I like to think uh, the best you know, of, of um, the opportunities at hand. And, um, but ultimately, right, um, all I need to do is make sure I'm not investing in uh, bad opportunities and I'm going to make money either way. I don't, and also short selling is labor intensive as well. Yeah. So that much return. Upside, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> there was one thing that stood out. I think I heard you say on a recent podcast that you currently are um, admiring a few managers out there. One of them being Carl Icon, a, a favorite of mine as well. Does this sort of uh, indicate that you guys would get active like Carl has famously done throughout his career? I think in limited uh, situations, yes. Um, I think that activism does have a role. And I guess in Australian markets, we really haven't seen it being done uh, well or um, in the right sort of manner, which I think it should be done. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, obviously, um, I, I think it's a really interesting space. And um, I think, you know, over the years ahead, um, it's quite possible we might get involved in certain situations. Mm. It's interesting out there on the on the flip side as well. You have seen big managers from the US retreat from from being quite active. Bill Ackman, Dan Loeb, sort of come to mind. They've sort of tried their hand at it, and for whatever reason, decided to to take a step back. Emmanuel, I'm keen to move on to to macro now. Um, you have spoken about inflation in the past. On interest rates to start with, are you in the sort of higher for longer camp or do you think the the rba and the fed are gonna you know re retract relatively soonly yeah well look i'm probably i, I look at real interest rates um, for starters so uh, for those that know that that's um basically um you know, the cash rate minus the rate of inflation so i think that ultimately you know real interest rates have been negative for some years now um do i think this will persist I would probably say yes. I think that you know it's really important to observe what the uh, changes and dynamics of society. You know what's going to happen in the future. Um, you, know, you see certain initiatives like the Inflation Reduction Act um, in the U.S., which is really pushing um, their society towards electrification. I think, but then you know on the other hand, you have um, you're going to have a period. Oh well, at the moment is. You know, solar, for example, or electric vehicles, are they really sustainable without subsidies? I would probably argue no at this stage. Is the Inflation Reduction Act anything but inflationary? Uh, I don't <laughs> disagree with you there. And, and that's kind of the point I'm getting to, you yeah. know, that um, uh, for initiatives like the Inflation Reduction Act to be successful, I would probably say that um, real interest rates have to be, you know, um, uh, very low. And it, does that sort of picking up on that thread, do you think inflation sort of takes longer than some may anticipate to wind back to that that targeted band that central banks have or do you see it hovering around yeah. where it is? Yeah, I think that inflation will remain elevated. Uh, for instance, the RBA inflation uh, target is between 2 and 3%, but we, I think the latest um, you know, rolling 12-month 12, uh, 12 uh, figure was 6%. So we're sitting at double. 
<laughs> the, yeah. the you know, target rate at the upper end. We have for quite some time. And we have for quite some time. So um, I think it will remain elevated. And, of course, one reason for that is, um, you know, we're still at, I think the latest unemployment figure was 3.5%. Um, back in uni, I was always taught that full employment is 4% or regarded as 4%. So we've yep. been over full inflation for, you know, a couple of years now, I'd say. And um, it doesn't look like it's easing you know, enough, I would say. So these interest rates, they've played into another dynamic that you've um, touched on in the past. And that's the the divergence in valuations between the big cap and the small, small cap stocks mm-hmm. on the ASX. And the interest rates sort of flow in by having a, a higher cost of capital, mm-hmm. which is... Um, you know, affected some companies more than others. And this has led mm. to DAT starting a, a small cap fund in the in the near term, I believe. Yes. What is the catalyst for the, the main reversion here? Is is it just interest rates coming down? That is the catalyst? Or is there something else that leads to the sort of main reversion, as you say? Well, I think that ultimately, um, uh, as, as you mentioned, I think um, this divergence between the small cap um, indexes and, um, you know, the larger cap indexes, um, this has only occurred um, a few instances in the last 30 years. And um, when this divergence has occurred, um, typically over the next three to five year period, we've seen um, very strong returns from the small cap space um, as yeah, these indexes uh, converge again. Um, small caps typically trade at high valuations during periods of stability. Um, right now, we have, I mean, recently we've gone through I guess um, the best way to describe it is um, there's been more uncertainty and fear, which lends itself to you know, investors trying to get into big caps because they're obviously more liquid and um, lower risk, of course. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that small caps um, will ha- once again have their day in the sunshine, but um, we're ultimately looking to find the best exposures in the space itself. So um, to answer your question, I think that Investor confidence um, or you know, building investor confidence over time ultimately leads to the you know, re-rate of these small cap opportunities. And of course, we've seen um, plenty of um, corporate you know, M&A action yeah. from private equity, from you know, very clever investors ultimately on public markets. And that really does tell you something, that there's some value to be found. Sure. So there's something you touched on there, which I want to dive into deeper. It's the liquidity or illiquidity in the in the small cap space mm-hmm. how do you manage that illiquidity and also make sure you get compensated for that yeah exactly well as you you know allude to um illiquidity should be you know there, there should be always an illiquidity premium they call it in, yep. in finance parlance as you're <laughs> probably aware yeah um and um, I guess in the past, during markets uh, where there's a lot of confidence, um, it basically is non-existent. Right now, I think that um, the illiquidity premium is um, accentuated, you know, over and above what it should be. And um, yeah, so but yeah, I think that um, uh, it's very difficult to quantify it in in you know to say, to ascribe a certain you know, percentage or anything like that. I think that it's very much um, uh, determined by asset quality as it should be, because ultimately asset quality is something that you're investing in for the medium term, and that gets you out of um, the liquidity constraints. You know? And um, yeah, I, I think that's why you know, we're so focused on, um, I guess, investing in quality assets for the you know, medium to long term. We've also seen plenty of managers leave the space as well, right, over the past decade or so, which yeah. just compounds the the impact and yeah. I guess something yeah. that you'd want to pick up on as an advantage going into the small cap arena. Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, I've, I know that there are a lot of um, small cap passive vehicles like small cap uh, ETFs that um, attempt to replicate, you know, um, small cap returns across just a broad index, which I think is a totally wrong way to do things, by the way. But um, these sort of vehicles are starting to uh, lose money and having to sell down indiscriminately. You, you, you're saying it's the wrong way of doing it. Is that because they just can't buy in at reasonable prices because some of these things trade 
10,000 shares a day or is there uh, something more than that? Yeah, well, basically um, with the ETFs, they're generally uh, market capitalization weighted and they obviously consider liquidity amongst other factors. Um, but it doesn't mean that um, every highly valued stock is a good investment opportunity over the medium to long term. Um, we've seen even many- more so in the in the short term sp- in the small cap space, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, you've seen like lots of um, you know stuff like GameStop and <laughs> AMC. You've seen you know just some crazy movement because people realise that well, in a stock with limited liquidity. Um, if you've got enough money behind you, you can um, really, you know, push valuations up to, you know, somewhat incredible uh, values. Sure. In some instances. And another reason for not wanting to be a, a short seller, right? Oh, no, no. <laughs> there's, there's another dynamic, and I think you're a great person to speak to about this because you're not entirely resource focused. You, yeah. you go across sectors. So there's a, a dynamic we see when you say you value a resource business Mm -hmm. and you do the standard way it'd be create a dcf and you don't have a terminal value because Mm -hmm. the mine life is the mine life and that's when the asset is done yeah comparing that to say a a tech or industrial business Mm -hmm. let's let's go tech you use a terminal value for the the theoretical value that the business will earn Mm -hmm. beyond whatever the amount of years you sort of forecast but when you actually look at the tech space there's many companies that don't last more than one you know tech advancement or cycle. Mm-hmm. They're not there, you know, 15 or 20 years later unless they're one of the behemoths like Apple, Microsoft mm-hmm. has shown. Do you think this is a sort of shortfall in uh, how investors value these businesses or do you think it's warranted? Uh, I think it's very short-sighted and I think that good um, operators or good um, um I guess people with a long-term view can really take advantage of these um, valuation mismatches, right? As as you allude to, I think that um, you know technology companies. I think in many instances are overvalued. Um, you know, I think that sure you have great franchises, you know the Googles and the Microsofts. Sure, I I get that they are valued uh, for the reasons, yeah, uh, because they've obviously got a great franchise and longevity. In their business models and sustainability, most importantly, but you see a lot of um, small cap tech companies that you know you just dig deep into the numbers and the business models, and it's like, well, you know, why are these values so high? Yeah. These, will, these will never be sustainable, etc. Whereas um, it's not necessarily the case in in um, resources. You know, I think that um, with resources, it's a very pure and binary outcome. Normally, either a production is good enough to get to um, uh, commercial viability or it isn't yeah yeah and that's what i really like because um it's almost like a treasure hunt in many ways and um, i think that uh, the market is all uh always struggles with valuing resource companies uh fairly but then once they're de-risked that's when you really get your big upside and that's the opportunity i guess you're you're speaking to getting in there before you have the re-rate right yeah absolutely Absolutely. I think that um, we've definitely sort of proven the ability to recognize what good quality opportunities are at a very early stage. And um, yeah, it, it's, um, I think it's, yeah, it's so stimulating to be able to look at, um, you know, smaller companies and um, that are trying to do, you know, bigger things ultimately and um, being able to, you know, really look at things with a hard commercial lens is what's needed and um yeah you can find some really great gems out there i think agreed so i think we should get into some more commodities before we get into some yeah. stocks you mentioned prior that you'd invested in the the energy complex specifically in in coal before and i'm not yes. sure if you're still in the space but what i want to specifically ask you about is the the risk and how you hedge it as it relates to royalties or super taxes or you know those similar mm. sort of things as it, we've seen it more and more. We saw it in New South Wales, in Queensland last year. Yeah. How do you think about that? Well, I think the beauty is um, because these are obviously larger cap names um, that we invest in, in the coal space in particular, the great thing is that you don't need to hold that exposure um, throughout periods of uncertainty. Uh, and um, the great thing about that is that you're able to, you know, um, de-risk your portfolio as much as you like. Because 
there's no real liquidity as, uh, constraints with the you know, larger ASX call positions, which are the best ones, to be honest. Yep. Um, and yeah, uh, I think that it's all about um, weighting your market exposure. Um, the New South Wales budget will be coming out in, in September. Um, so that is obviously um, something that I think will be quite critical to see you know, what the prospective returns are. Um, I think the last thing anyone wants to see is a Queensland situation, which I felt was um, really onerous, you know, and it's really um, set the state back <laughs> a lot, I would say, in terms of um, investor perception. I think BHB would take your, your point of view as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, ultimately, it's something that I have definitely observed, you know, the governments, oh, governments globally are becoming a lot more proactive about trying to capture returns from these sort of assets. Uh, look at what's going on in Africa, for instance. Yeah, the, the resource nationalism yeah. rise isn't isn't abiding anytime soon, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's not only restricted to jurisdictions like Africa now, right? If some if a state like Queensland can um, make uh, or can enforce such punitive um, actions against the resource industry, um, it really does um, lift the perception of sovereign risk overall. Um, sure, there'll obviously be states that don't do that. Hopefully, WA doesn't do that any time. <laughs> Let's hope so. Yeah, but um, but it, it really does make um, investing in Western Australian assets yeah a lot more attractive relatively <laughs> to, than Queensland or New South Wales, presumably if they lift the royalty rates um, on coal going forward. So I want to touch on rare earths, which is a, a sector I know you're somewhat close to. Mm -hmm. And this really ties in with the, the resource globalization mm -hmm. as well, given the China dominance in this sector. So we, we recently saw peak rare earths move away from their sort of stance of being non-China aligned. They were mm -hmm. going to go downstream in, in yeah. England. And they've done a bit of a U-turn on that. They now have a major Chinese shareholder and they've signed an offtake with a, that same party. Yeah. Is there any other way you see? Obviously, we've got any Arbor and other things in the works and MP materials in, in the US, but is there any other way for juniors in the rare earth space to you know take advantage without being partnered with a Chinese player? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, in Africa, um, you know, um, Chinese influence is extremely strong, you know, far more than you know, any other Western nation, for, in my opinion. Um, so I think that if you have a resource um, or holding a resource in Africa, um, I think Chinese, um, uh, I guess, participation in the project at some level is uh, inevitable, you know, ultimately. Um, however, you know, if you're holding a, a rare earth deposit in Western Australia, it's a very different proposition. Um, we have Linus re onshoring, you know, a good portion of their processing to Western Australia, but you've also got um, a Luca that's been government funded, you know, for a rare refinery um, in WA as well. So um, I think that ultimately lowers the bar for um, you know, uh, upstream rare earth deposits in Western Australia because you, know, you can just be trucked to, you know, Linus or Luca, presumably. Yeah. And uh, oh, I'm not, not sure if Hastings are still <laughs> undergoing their own processing operation. We'll have to see about that one. Yeah, but it doesn't look too, um, yeah, too promising at this stage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that ultimately um, it's a good thing, you know, um, uh, yeah, to have multiple avenues of commercialization. Beautiful. We'll get on to the, the stock specific section. There's a, a couple of names I know you've spoken about that we'll get into. So you recently played a, a hypothetical game with, with Livewire where you had $10,000 to hypothetically mm -hmm. invest across three names and you could keep a portion in cash. Yeah. And I want to talk about two of them given two uh, resource companies. Yeah. So first up, WA1. And I know you've spoken with uh, with Trav and Maddie in the past yeah. about this one. Um, some, some things have changed since then, but things are still going full steam ahead mm. at WA1. And I do need to declare that I'm a shareholder as well. I like the story. But I want to speak to you firstly about MET. That's the big concern with mm. me. And I want to know how you get comfortable with the MET. I know they've done some preliminary preliminary analysis, mm -hmm. but how do you get comfortable given it's just such a big risk for a stock like this? I think the really great thing about WA1 is just the sheer grade of the deposit. You know, I think that, uh, you know, in, ter in terms of our own calculations, we expect um, 
the deposit to be you know over two percent in terms of any sort of um, resource estimate that they put out. So even if you're recovering, um, or even if, if you're able to recover only fifty percent of that, um, that's still higher grade than any other um, deposit aside from um, Arax Araxa yep. <laughs> at the moment. So I think that. Um, makes it still um, incredibly robust, I would say, even assuming very poor recoveries. Sure. And then on the the outcomes from what they produce there, are you, are you more excited or more focused on the potential alloy aspect or the, the potential battery alignment or just both? Uh, I would say both. I think that, of course, um, you know, as a base case, you would um, assume ferro-niobium would be, uh, which is obviously used in the steel industry. Um, considering it's 90% of niobium consumption, that's what you have to really focus on ultimately at the start of the project. Um, of course, the niobium battery technology is still in the process of being commercially validated. So that's almost like a moonshot um, opportunity that might may or may not happen. So I think that, um, you know, you've got to be really focused on um, what the near term um, drivers are in terms of the product production rather than investing in fairy tales or uh, maybes. <laughs> you know? and, and on the market downstream, how, how do you sort of view this? I think the numbers were 120,000 tonnes was the, the total consumption yeah. last year of, of niobium. Are you sort of, of of the belief that it's a market that can grow and increase supply will bring about increased demand? Or do you just think that they have a higher grade product and they can force their way into whatever the market is? Mm -hmm. How do you think about that? Uh, I think it works both ways. I think that they could, um, you know, given Aruxa produces, I think, about 85% of global production, you've got 15% to attack immediately because um, ultimately I think at this point, I think it's quite clear that this is um, the world's uh, second best deposit out there um, after, you know, Aruxa, which, is, yeah. which produces 85%. So um, in that aspect, I think that, um, you know, assuming, um, of course, there are you know, many boxes to be ticked off until production. And, um, but, you know, I really do think the diversity of supply angle is going to be important as well. Um, and ultimately, um, it, it's driven by very real factors and, and practicalities, ultimately. Um, in construction, you know, weight equals cost. And if there's an opportunity to reduce um, that weight at a very um, low cost, you know, per ton, um, why wouldn't you? You know, why wouldn't Blue Scope start incorporating um, niobium and steel produced locally, for instance, right? Absolutely. Their yeah. advantages. So the second stock you mentioned there was Global Lithium. And to be completely honest, on their scoping study that came out in February of this year, yeah. I wasn't convinced by some of the assumptions that they'd used. I think mm -hmm. there was a there was a lofty lithium forecast price and a few other bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. What makes you think this this company is undervalued, or perhaps that the market isn't quite seeing as you see it? Uh, well, I think this um, resource has a lot of strategic value, and why I say that is uh, we've seen takeovers of essential metals, for instance, or, or um, you know attempted takeovers. Um, essential metals. Um, I think their deposit is only about 12 million tonnes at a fairly low grade. Um, yeah, I think it's you know, quite similar to GL. Yeah, similar, similar grade. Yeah. yeah. So I think the fact that you had IGO and you had uh, mineral resources to you know, the biggest lithium participants in Australia vying for you know, what looks to be a fairly modest sized resource um, really does tell you something. I think GL1 uh, really do have good uh, potential exploration upside as well. Um, in addition to what we think, you know, we think they're undervalued just based on their current resource of I think it's about 55 million tons at the moment. Um, I think that also, um, you know, the scoping study would probably encapsulate um, uh, capital expenditure that may not be required if it's bolted onto someone like mineral resources operations, which is sure. quite close by. So I think Maddie's, Maddie's uh, punt was that given developers now taken out Essential and they have the tie-in with MinRes, 
Yeah. Minres also has, I think, a 10% stake in, yeah, in GL1. One. Yeah. And he thinks develop and Minres sooner or later will bandy together. Yeah. That's his long shot prediction of how that all marries up. But it, mm. there are merits to it given the uh, synergies that could be experienced between Mount Marion, you know, Essentials, Pioneer Dome yeah. in, in the area, yeah. right? Yeah, I think so. And I think that ultimately um, in resources, they don't need develop in this case because why would you want to share, you know, your economics ultimately? Absolutely. And um, so that's yeah, just what I think. Uh, will happen and um, you know ultimately there's been just a huge um, push towards you know um, midstream and downstream players even um, you know the actual manufacturers are getting into upstream supply and you have to ask your question why would Ford be you know funding Winetown for instance if they weren't um, you know confident that um, supply would be available at some future date and um, it's very rare, you know, ultimately when you think about it, you know, logically. Yeah, the push downstream has been been pretty enormous. Mm. There's another stock I want to talk about, Dreadnought. Mm-hmm. I've also heard you touch on this one in the past. So they've got a resource coming out relatively yeah. soon. And, I mean, they've, they've also had a share price that's come off 50-odd percent mm. over the past year or year to date. Yeah. What do you wait to the share price coming off the reasoning behind that and how much sort of stock do you put in um, this upcoming resource? Uh, yeah, I think that it's a good one. Um, I think that um, Dreadnought, I think that they um, are obviously still um, at the process of, of discovering what exactly they have on their ground. Um, I think they have certainly been hamstrung by sort of delayed assays and all that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, they've just got a great, yeah, package of ground and they've had, um, you know, I think their resource itself, it's um, a really good, you know, a resource that they put out given that I think the discovery was made um, only about a year ago or so. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, it's still an evolving story, of course, and um, I think it's a strict, um, significant strategic value, ultimately. The last stock I want to talk about is Adriatic, and this is Another one that um, we on the show have spoken about quite quite fondly. We've mm-hmm. interviewed Paul Cronin yeah. and Matt Hines, and um, we quite like it. But they came out with this capital raise last week that kind of kind of ticked me off. They're three or so months from production, and I know they did make it explicitly clear that the money was for exploration, mm-hmm. and they're you know they're not trading at all time lows or anything like that. So it wasn't the most dilutionary of of raises. Yeah. So to start with, what did you make of of the capital raise? Yeah. Um- I was, uh, I guess, a little surprised as well, to be honest. Um, but, however, I thought through things and um, I guess it's really a question, when do you delay? Uh, like how long? Like, of course, they're coming into production towards the end of this year and presumably we'll have, you know, cash flows coming in from December, January, let's say, uh, assuming, yeah, nothing, yeah, everything's on on critical path. Yep. Um so this raise, I believe, was done um, to sort of progress exploration, and um, I can understand that rationale. You know, they've had a lot of ex- lot of success um, extending the existing deposit, and you know, I think their latest buy life is about twenty years, I'd say, going off um, the latest MRE. Um, with these sort of um, companies, you know, when they're finan- when you're financing um, a, a product um, a project into production. Um, typically, you're somewhat constrained in what you can spend your cash by the project financier on. So, you, you know, a project financier doesn't want them going out and um, pouring money <laughs> into expiration holes um, just in case, you know, the project's delayed yep. and then, you know, that, that kicks the risk profile out. So I believe um, the raise was informed um, on that basis, you know, so but what the raise does, it really gives them the capacity to go out and um, continue drilling um, aggressively and adding value through the drill bit ultimately and kicking that LOM um, or extending that LOM, which I think will be a big uh, value uplift. Hopefully. I'm still suspicious, but time will sort of tell how, how that plays out. And I'm, I'm hopeful because the guys have impressed me in the past. How do you think of the, the re-rate there as they move from developer to a producing, what sort of you know numbers would you anticipate that um, 
the company would be valued on in, in future? Yeah, I think it'll be significant. Um, it, I guess it all really depends on, um, I mean, so given it's a polymetallic deposit, and I think they're selling about three separate uh, products uh, in terms of concentrates out of that um, project. I think a lot will ultimately come down to what sort of payability they can prove to the market, uh, presuming that it's in line with um, you know, their, their study parameters. I'll probably say that there's still significant upside in this name. And the last bit I wanted to touch on on Adriatic is something that's sort of been front and centre very recently. So when you look at various resource stocks out there, mm. you often think some things look a bit too good to be true and it's often with with good reason, especially in riskier jurisdictions. So for me, Leo Lithium comes to mind and the cash flows that they were imminently printing from their DSO operations in, in Mali look too good to be true and the, the stock did re-rate quite well and now they're in trading halt and they have been so for, for a month mm. or so. How do you think about... Adriatic in in this context, they've got a ten percent corporate tax rate in Bosnia, which historically has a as a, a mining jurisdiction been been strong, but mm-hmm. not in not in recent times. And this asset, I believe, will make up one to two percent of the GDP of the country. How do you think about that risk? You know, it's a bit of a long um, uh, you know string to draw, I guess, between comparing Mali to Bosnia. Uh, I guess Bosnia is. Um, part of Europe, ultimately. And, um, you know, it's Adriatic itself is being um, financed by the European Bank for Redevelopment and uh, Reconstruction, I think it's called. Um, So very, um, you know, credible uh, institution over there. So I think that the risk of uh, the economics being affected by royalty raises, um, I don't think it's going to happen, given the lack of mining or, yeah, uh, current mining, I should say, in Bosnia. Um, it is a risk, though. My uh, only however, pushback would be yeah. um, Jadar. I think that's how you pronounce yeah. it. The, the Rio Tinto asset, yes. obviously not in in, in Bosnia. Yeah. It's in Serbia, nearby. Yeah, but that's that's the only one that sort of comes to mind. Yeah. Well, I think that was more of a permitting issue yeah, rather right. than yeah. you know royalty related. And you know, I think that Jadar that does get built in time ultimately. But um, yeah, I think that it's very, very difficult to um, compare Adriatic's deposit in any way, shape or form to any other, you know, um, uh, jurisdiction and project. It's something that's very unique and uh, very high quality, ultimately. And how would you go about selling down a stake in that? Do you sort of see once they've had a a re-rate and you think they're, they're fully valued or is this, you know, do you think I don't want to hold it through a cycle? How do you kind of think about letting go of the shares once you've, you know, made made a decent return on your yeah. investment? Yeah. Well, when I start getting pitched for stock, that's when I know I've got to hold on a bit longer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've okay. been pitched for plenty of times. Okay, I, I can like tell it. you that. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, but but um, you know, I mean, in all seriousness, I think that um, you really have to see what um, you know, or how much weight you want to carry as as a proportion of the portfolio. And I think that there comes a point in time when generally a position grows too big, given you know the nature of the company or or you know where the company is positioned in its development life cycle, and um, when you start to feel uncomfortable about um, you know there's a potential downside, right? Every everything in life and everything in the markets has risk. When you um, become unusually focused or or over you know, thinking a lot about that. Yeah, positional risk. I think that's definitely the time when you've got to cut down. <laughs> Great, love it, Emmanuel. I want to finish on a underrated versus overrated section. This is uh, yeah. a, a little dynamic that the uh, the money miners have liked. So I'm just going to spit out stock names, commodities, sure. various things, and one word answers: underrated, overrated. Mm-hmm. All right, let's start. Vulcan Energy Resources. Overrated. Midstream production of lithium in Australia, e.g. what Pilbara Minerals are aiming to do? Uh, I would probably say overrated. Centaurus Metals, who have the Jaguar nickel deposit in Brazil. Overrated. (laughs) Being based in Perth to invest in resources, overrated or underrated? Uh, Underrated. Inflation, higher for longer? Uh, Underrated. 
Sayona Lithium. Um, overrated. Metals Acquisition Corp, the, the SPAC that's going to list sooner or later here in Australia. Um, I'm neutral because I don't know too much about it. <laughs> Safe. Piedmont Lithium. Uh, overrated, I'd say. Gaining Alpha from Fintwit. Uh, underrated. Metals X. Underrated. And lastly, downstream battery production in Australia. Overrated. Beautiful. Thanks a lot for your time, Emmanuel. I'm sure the money miners will really love it and I've learned plenty. So cheers. Thanks, Janice. Well, it appears JD finally got all the cameras and audio working by himself. Congrats, <sighs> JD. He had a ripping conversation, JD. What a legend. That was awesome. What a legend. And what a and Manny D, what a what a great bloke. Absolute Beautiful. gentleman and as you said, hi, hyper bloody intelligent. And uh, but just it's just a con it's just a constant tone of knowledge coming out of his <laughs> mouth, Manny D. <laughs> Yeah, the more he talks and, and the less uh, we do. The more do. he talks, the more stupid yeah. I feel. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, thanks again to all the uh, podcast partners, the Money of Mine partners. Buddy, oh, God, I got I nearly got to have them written up in front of me. We're getting that many. <laughs> top, top Drill, K Drill, JP Search, Anytime Exploration and Terra Capital. We appreciate all your support for Money of Mine. It is keeping the lights on. Thank you very much, partners. And hooteroo. Hooteroo. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.